Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's Star Trek Picard, which debuted on CBS All Access, season one, episode one, entitled Remembrance. For those of you who are subscribers, welcome back. I'm glad to see you. And for those of you who are visitors, as I do a recap, I make sure to do a recap of the entire episode while I have photos to the side so it can give you visual interpretations and I give the review at the end. That's all coming up next. is Bunny. <laughs> the opening scene, we see the Enterprise, and then we zoom in into Data and John Luke sitting down for a game of poker. And for those of you that are Trekkies, we remember this scene and we remember this feeling of them sitting together and sharing a wonderful game of poker. As they continue their game of poker, Jean-Luc says, when you have a good hand, your left pupil dilates. And when you're trying to call a bluff, your eyes remain neutral. And Data says, ah, thank you, Captain. I'll make sure to take note of that and change my deceptive ways while playing poker. And Jean-Luc gives a nice little smirk with that and they continue and it's very relaxed upon the Enterprise. And all of a sudden, Jean-Luc notices that Mars is outside of the window. And he says, that's strange. I never knew that we changed course going to Mars. And then we see that there's turbulence and things begin to shake. And we see several explosions that happen and a big flash, which lets us know that this is something that he's remembering during the galactic tragedy. When he awakens, we see Jean-Luc in bed and he is approached by his dog that he's conveniently named number one. And he's comforted by the dog and he goes to his balcony and we see the Chateau Picard. So he's retired to this place of something that he remembers, the vineyard in France. The scene shifts to modern day Boston and we zoom into a couple that's sharing a nice evening and a glass of wine and they're talking and they are just totally engulfed in one another, looking in each other's eyes and smiling. And she says, well, you know, this special celebration that we're having, why don't you use your special techniques to figure out what I have to tell you and what that surprise is? And he says, I don't know. Hmm. It's a surprise and a secret but it's a happy secret. I don't know, why don't you just tell me? And she says, I got into Daystrom. He's like, wow, that's just amazing. I know you could do it. Maybe I'll even see you in the cafeteria. What is it exactly that you'll be doing? And she says, I am a fellow of artificial intelligence and quantum consciousness. And he says, that's great and I'm so happy for you. And they continue to laugh and have a good date night. All of the sudden they have intruders that come into the apartment and they unfortunately murder her boyfriend and they're tussling with her back and forth saying who are you where did you come from where are you from and she says I'm from Seattle what do you want she's completely confused about what's going on and they're saying hurry up we need to do what we have to do before she becomes activated and they're holding her down and they're putting a device on her forehead and it looks like they're trying to scan and get information from her memory so they then cloak her and they put a hood over her head and they say, hurry up before she comes activated. And all of a sudden, we hear this click and this electrical beeping. And they say, oh no, she's activated. And then she proceeds to fight and whoop tail and take them on head to head, punch and throwing them around. And before we know it, by the end of the scene, she has conquered everyone in the room. And she's looking at her hands and she's looking around. And she seems so surprised and shocked that she was able to fight and she was able to just take all of them down. Once she gets over that shock, she then goes to her boyfriend and she sees, sees that he is deceased, unfortunately. And she's crying and she's so confused about what just happened. And as she thinks about that, she has a flash of vision and she see, sees Picard's face. And she doesn't know what's going on. And after that happens, we then have the opening introduction 
of the show. Jean-Luc continues his walk along the vineyard, ending at a balcony area where they have dressed the table with food to eat. And we hear from conversation that there are two individuals, Loris and Jabin, that are there assisting him at the vineyard. And we also notice by the characteristics that they are Romulans. The lady says, you know, Jabin told me that you had another bad dream and that he heard you and he says, I, the dreams are okay, they're beautiful. It's the waking up that I have a problem with. And she says, well, you know, you have to get ready. Join Jabin in the kitchen so you can have breakfast. You have to get ready. And Jabin says, I know that it's gonna be hard, but you can do this. And Jean-Luc asked him, you know, you did go over with the interviewer the things that I won't talk about, correct? And he says, yes, we went over that. We, we made sure to emphasize that you are talking about the aftermath of the supernova and the galactic tragedy. Nothing to with you specifically. We've already gone over that. And Laura says, you know, I see that you are slowly forgetting who you are but we haven't forgot who you are, what you did, what you've done. Remember that. And Jaban says, yes, be the captain that they remember. And we see that there is a crew of people, there's a staff and they're setting up for an interview. He's, he's checking his suit, he's checking his tie. He gets situated in the seat and all of a sudden we hear a narration of the scenes that come before the interview. The network then plays the footage and we hear the narration. He was one of our galaxy's most intrepid explorers, military strategist and humanitarian. We sit here today with Admiral Jean-Luc Picard to discuss the anniversary of the Romulan supernova. He talks about his role during this galactic tragedy. And it pans and we see both the interviewer and Picard sitting face to face. And she says, Admiral John Luke, I am honored to sit here with you today to discuss. And he says, oh, retired, no longer Admiral, call me Jean Luke. And she says, but yes, I have to pay respect and I'm, I'm thanking you that you allowed the galaxy to be in your room. And he says, well, I thought that the room would be a little bit more crowded. And she doesn't really laugh at that, but he's trying to make her feel comfortable and start the interview with a little laugh. The interviewer's tone seems to feel very pushy in how she begins to ask Jean-Luc questions. And she says, well, how did you feel at that moment knowing that the Romulan sun was about to explode? How did you feel about that? And he says, there's no way to describe how I felt knowing that this tragedy was about to happen. Well, she says, well, you don't know how you felt when you felt about that, but at the same time, you caused for this massive relocation of Romulans. And he says, the Romulans asked for our help and they needed us. And she says, well, you know, I really think that's convenient because a lot of people feel that their resources would have been better and used for something else, a greater good, not helping out Romulans who are known to be enemies of the Federation. That doesn't make any sense. And Jean-Luc goes in to describe that the Romulan needed our help and the Federation understood that we needed to help them. It was our duty to help them. And she then proceeds to show footage of the traumatic day of things exploding and death. And you could see that it's making Jean-Luc feel very uncomfortable. And she says, you know, what you did calling for this relocation of over, what, nine, 900 people, 900 million Romulans to be just scattered across the galaxy and, and relocated? And he says, that is what was needed lives were at stake and she says no Romulan lives and he said no lives it was our duty to help people who knew it and who needed that and the Federation knew that the interviewer expresses what you did was about as ambitious as the building of the pyramids and he says no the building of the pyramids is it was this ambitious building a vanity. What we did was helping. And he said, if you want to get into the historical research of that, well, Don Kirk. She's confused and says, Don Kirk. 
And he says, yes, but look, I thought that we were going to talk about something else. I, we, you promised that we were going to talk about something else. And she says, okay. She doesn't let up and she says that day you had a bunch of rogue synthetics that were able to let down the defense shields and hack the Mars defensive net. And it's still burning till this day. Mars is still burning until this day, which led to the ban of synthetics. And John Luke says, I, I can't explain why a bunch of synthetics went rogue that day. I can't explain that and I don't know why. But I disagree that banning the synthetics was a good idea. I don't think that was a good idea. And she says, well, you know, you had uh, data that was aboard and he was synthetic. Did you ever doubt him? Did you ever lose your faith in him at all? And he says, not for one moment. I never doubted him and I never had lost my faith about when it came to data. She says, you don't agree with that. Okay, but you quit. You resigned from that. What is the real reason why? Why did you leave Starfleet? And Jean-Luc gives this deep breath of trying not to get frustrated, trying to keep his cool. He's clutching his hand in his fist in his lap, trying to not let the emotions get the best of him because as she's speaking, she's still playing the explosions. She's still playing all of the things that would bring anyone trauma from war and from this event. And he says, you know, Starfleet wasn't Starfleet. She says, what, what, what did you say? And he says, the Starfleet wasn't Starfleet. What they did Giving that command to abandon the rescue was against what we stood for. That is not what we stood for. To stand by and see that we are leaving millions of people there to be abandoned is not what we stand for. I didn't agree with that. And I'm not going to stand by and be a bystander knowing that this is wrong. The galaxy was still mourning. People were still, were still hurting. And that command meant that I agreed with that. I had to step down from that command because that doesn't correlate with who we are. You have to be careful about what questions that you're answering, answer, asking and not understanding the, the depth of what you're talking about. You've never been in a war. You can wave your hand and you can show all of this footage about what happened, but you weren't there. You'll never understand the capacity of what people went through. You'll never understand what, what I meant when I mentioned Don Kirk. You don't even know who that is. You have to understand that we have to stand for something that is for helping people, being a representation of good. You don't know what you're talking about. And he says eloqu eloquently at the end, we're done here. And he walks off and I'm on the couch like, drop the mic, Picard, drop the mic. <laughs> and the interviewer is just left in the chair in shame and she has nothing else to say and all she can do is drop her head and as this is happening we notice that the same young lady that's at the beginning of the episode she sees the footage passing by in the store and she recognizes that wow this man giving this interview that face that is the same face that I saw in my vision. John Luke later is in his vineyard and as he's sitting there, he sees someone in the distance and it's the same young lady from the previous scene. And as she approaches him, she says, I know you, I, I saw you, not just the interview, but I, I saw your face and everything in me led me to come here. And she says, do you know me? He says, well, no, I, I don't know you. You know, take a breath, calm down. What happened to you? And she's telling him about, about the event that happened while she was with her boyfriend, the fight and everything. And she says, in that moment, for some strange reason, I knew how to fight. I knew what to do. I knew how to track you down. And I don't know why, but something is telling me that I'm safe here with you and that I'm okay. He tries to calm her down and we see that she's joined Loris and Jaban on the balcony and he's trying to tell her, hey, drink some tea, relax. I just want to speak with you to get more detail about what's going on. And Loris and Jaban, they confirm that 
that they're going to get an area ready so if she wants to relax and stay there that she can and Jean-Luc agrees with that so they sit down and they begin to talk and she says I just I don't know what led me here I don't know why it's just something telling me that I should be here with you and he says I believe that you believe you should be here and that you're a very good person because if you weren't uh, number one would have told me so. And we see the dog, he's sit, laying down and he's just like, hmm. So we see that she's not of any harm because the dog doesn't feel threatened and the dog doesn't think that she's trying to attack Jean-Luc. So it gives this calm to the scene. And he says, you know, that's a very unique necklace that you have on. What is that? And she says, well, you know, my father gave this to me and I've always had it. And he says, it's very unique. He then goes on to say, well, you know, what is your name? And we learn that her name is um, Adaj. And she says that um, I just feel safe. I'm glad that I am here with you. And maybe we can go more in detail about what's happening to me because I don't know. We then see later on Jean-Luc is having another vision. And on his vineyard, he sees data and he's painting a picture. And we can hear the wind blowing softly and Jean-Luc walking closer and closer to Data. And he's looking at the painting that Data has. And Data says, would you like to finish it, Captain? And Jean-Luc says, well, I don't know how. And Data confirms that that is not true, sir. And then we come out of that vision and Jean-Luc comes to. And when he awakens, he looks at the wall and sees that same painting that Data was working on in his vision. And he literally says, no, like, no way. I just had this dream and this painting is on the wall. And Loris walks into the room and she says, the young woman, she's gone. And I don't know where she went on the scanners. It doesn't show that she's anywhere on the property. And Jean-Luc says, well, find out what you can find out. If you see anything else, if she comes back onto the property, please alert me. But there's somewhere that I got to go. I have to leave right now. Jean-Luc goes to the Starfleet archives. And as he walks into the building, he asks the index. OK, so no one else has access to these archives, correct? And the index says, well, we did want to sell tickets at one point so everyone could see it, but that didn't work out. And Jean-Luc doesn't think that's funny and he tells her to keep her day job. And the index informs him that if you have any questions, just say index. And he continues to walk into his archive area punches in the code and we see the Picard banner. And for those of you that are Trekkies, I'll mention this in the review, we see the banner, which means a lot to him that he has within his archive. He goes into his archive and he notices after he's punched in his code, he sees a painting, but not just a painting. The painting has the face of Dodge and he says, index, who did this painting? What is this painting and where did it come from? We then see the index appear and she says, this is a painting that was given to you by Data, but it is a set. The other painting is with you in your home. And John Luke, he's just really just blown away by this whole experience. And he says, well, every painting has a name. What is the name of this painting? The index goes into its mind and thinking of the files and says, this painting is called Daughter. Daj is still on the run. She's still confused about what is happening. She looks panicked. She sits down to call her mother. And as she's calling her mother, she says, mom, I'm on the run. Somebody tried to kill me and I don't know why so much is happening. Happening. You have to help me. I need to know what's going on. And the mother says, you must go back to Picard. And Dodge says, but wait, I, I didn't tell you where I went or mention Picard. And the mother says, I don't have time to explain. You must go back to Picard. He will keep you safe. And she says, well, I, well, now I don't know how. I mean, what am I supposed to do? And the mother says, close your eyes and focus. And don't just focus. But when you focus, think Picard. 
and she closes her eyes and all of a sudden we see that she's very focused and she pulls these files in the database to track down exactly where Picard is. And it's this source of intelligence that she didn't know she had. Dodge finds Picard at the archives and he's like, you found me? How, how did you find me here? How did you know I would be here? And she says, it's something really weird going on with me. I, I, I don't know. I knew how to track you down. I knew you were here and, and something must be wrong with me. I think I'm schizophrenic. I really don't know. Or oh, I have head trauma. And Picard says, no, 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 no. I just saw this painting and, and I remembered what it was. And, and, and it's a painting and it was of you. What you're describing, if my thoughts are correct, you are more important than you know. You're saying that you're having memories that are appearing as flashes. And, and, and if I'm correct, you're more important to me than you would ever know. Data and, and all of his creations, that has a correlation. And, and, and if I'm guessing correctly, then we have got to go to the Daystrom Institute. And she says, well, no, I was accepted to the Daystrom Institute. And he's like, well, that's, that's great as well. But we must go there. You and your thoughts and all of your capabilities, what you're seeing needs secu secu uh, security clearance. And not everybody has those security clearances. So we've got to go there now. And as they're discussing this, Dosh says, no, they're here. We've got to go. So they begin to run. And as they're running, Picard's like, well, <laughs> wait. <laughs> remembering that she's just taking off running but he's an older man and he's like wait I, I can't keep up with you so she holds him and she guides them as she runs but unfortunately Picard can't keep up with her and how she needs and as they arrive as the attackers arrive she goes into her mode and she continues to whoop butt and kick and flip and punch and more and more start to come down. And we notice that when they laser strike and it hits the ground, we see sparks and we see fire. But when it hits her, it has no effect. So that lets the audience know that yes, she is very special and there is ve something very unique going on with her. As she's fighting, Picard is trying to take cover and not get hit by everything that's going on. And as she's done doing that, she's becoming slower and, and slowly being outnumbered and she continues to fight. As she's fighting, one of the attackers mask comes off and Picard notices that the attackers are Romulan. She continues to fight and as one of the Romulan, before he dies, he spits something on her. And when he spits it on her, the liquid starts to make her body disintegrate and she doesn't know what's going on and the gun that she retrieved that is becoming you know it's starting to disappear and we slowly start to see her disappear and scream as she starts to disintegrate and Picard is just like no no he notices that she's slowly becoming destroyed and it engulfs her and there is a huge explosion such an explosion that it kills her and knocks Picard back several feet several feet away and unfortunately Dodge is no more. John Luc awakens and he sees Jaban and Loris and they're comforting him while he's on the couch and she says wow you I'm glad you're okay you took a fall you know fortunately there's nothing wrong with your head you just fell back several feet and there was this explosion and he says well where's Dodge? And Loris is telling him that, that she's nowhere to be found and you were by yourself and that the security cameras can prove that. And he says, no, 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 she was there with me. There must have been something on the scanners to cloak that she was there with me, but she was there. And they are confused just as he is about what's going on. And Jean-Luc has this epiphany and he says, you know, it's something going on with this entire experience. She came to me for a reason. She says she felt safe and something pulled her towards me. I've got to find out what is going on. For the longest time, I thought I needed to be retired and sitting here. And every day I have these thoughts of what's going on, but 
I have to live. I'm not living. I'm sitting here and I'm ma making myself slowly die. I've got to get up and I've got to find out what is happening. I won't take for that an answer for that for that as an answer. I've got to get up and I've got to research what is going on. Picard arrives at the Daystrom Institute and he's walking around so we know that he's looking for somebody very specific and then we see a young lady and he says ah hello um dr girardi she says no no call me agnes and he says you know what research what can you tell me and how can we have a synthetic mimic human flesh <laughs> and she gives this laugh like <laughs> yeah right and he has this look like no i'm serious and she goes on to explain that there is nothing of the sort. The research that we have left is very min minimal and there's no way to make a synthetic mimic human flesh. So we can't do that, especially after all of the bans. She goes on to the department that used to research this and she shows him an inferior copy of data. Um, and she says, this is all of what's left of him. He tried to download his neural net before he died, but you know, it was destroyed and there was nothing that we could do. So this is all that is left. She also explains that Bruce Maddox is the one that recruited her and that was his thing. He wanted to get into that research. He was very specific with that. But after the ban, Bruce shut down and it really detached him and his, his, that was his life. That was what he was consumed with. And Jean-Luc says, okay, well, what does this necklace mean, mean to you? What, can you explain this symbol that's on this necklace? And Agnes says, well, where did you get that? And he says, this is from the so-called um, synthetic that you said that couldn't exist, that mimicked human flesh. She informs him that that symbol represents fractal neuronic cloning. And he says, okay, so the only way to really research this is if we have Dodge, some sort of existence to help us along the way, but we don't have that and we don't have data, but wow, Dodge has to be Data's daughter. He always wanted a daughter. And Agnes has that look of shock and disappointment, which I think they allowed us to see because it's clearly something that the doctor knows that she can't share with us. Although she does share that when those are created, they are created in sets. So Jean-Luc says, so in order for us to find out, we've got to find the other one. We have to find its twin so we can figure out where are they coming from and why they exist. The music changes for the next scene and this dark villain energy style. And we see that we've reached a Romulan site and the camera focuses on one person specifically, and we can make a good guess that he is going to be an enemy for the next few episodes just by the music. So he approaches a young lady that looks exactly like Dodge. So we know that this is where her twin is located. And he says, oh, I'm, I didn't mean to intrude Dr. Asher. I just wanted to say, hello, I'm Narek and I'm new here. And he says, she says, no, 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 call me Soji. And he says, that's a very beautiful name, Soji. You know, I don't mean to do this, but you know, I, I just noticed your necklace. And she says, yeah, you know, it was given to me um, by my dad, you know, it was given to me and my twin. And he says, hmm, I had a brother, but unfortunately we lost him last year and he says well anyway you know look at me you know I know the last thing you want to hear after a hard day's work and listening to everybody else's problems is to listen to mine after hours you know I, how inconvenient of me she says no you you think wrong you know let's let's go talk and he agrees to that and we see the deception of him on purpose going after her more specifically, which can lead us to, wow, what is gonna happen in the next episode now that we have located the twin of Dodge? And that is the end of the episode.